So now that people are popping on and stuff, I just, um, I'll quickly want to tell you how, how honored I am that you're sitting here with me and having this discussion. Um, I read your book, I think it was last fall and like quickly, quickly fell in love with it and started giving out copies to everyone that I knew and it became like my go-to Christmas gift for everybody that I knew regardless of their gender. Mm -hmm. um, I just was so floored by your book and um, your writing style and I just I and felt so excited when I read it and I felt so empowered because not only did it come for me like at a time where I was doing some deep soul searching and just some digging inward but it just your Prop, your prose is just so powerful and descriptive and for me it's as if you can you describe the sensation of light breaking through a window pane or like the sound of the wind and you don't inject nostalgia into it but you just have this like way with your words that are just so beautiful and especially with your nonfiction, um you know so often we read you know books, uh, nonfiction books, and it's like we get the shell of a person and not the full 360 view. And I think with your writing, you really allow the reader to really see somebody and get the whole landscape and atmosphere, which is just as important as the person subject um, themselves. And I, you do that so beautifully in Three Women. I have fallen in love with all of them over and over again in different ways. And I resonate with all of them in different ways and throughout my life I can see points where I'm like oh my god I so see Sloan and myself or Maggie in a situation and Lena and it's just so um it was just it hit me really hard so I just feel so grateful for this book and I feel like it came at like the right time and um that is and, so kind thank you no thank you <laughs> I mean tell me a little bit about how how you got to this point like how did you have this idea um i mean i know in the prologue you write about your mother but i don't know you, like i want to hear all about it how you started it and what your my current editor asked me uh, if i wanted to write a book and i but i said that sounds great but you know like about what and he basically said whatever you want which was kind of this amazing thing. And at the same time, completely terrifying. Cause what, you know, I was just like Googling things that I might want to write about, like, you know, dog sledding. Like I was just like, <laughs> what did I write about? Um, and, you know, I started thinking about desire um, in, in terms of for the past, like that I was uh, like my, my whole, 20s was spent with friends like unpacking text messages and you know what um what what did that mean and what and all of that and and I was so interested in the idea of desire and I had read this book um called uh Thy Neighbor's Wife by Gay Talese which was essentially kind of taking the pulse on of desire back in the late 70s and early 80s and he went to like swingers mansions and did all this like weird um sex stuff he he operated a massage parlor with happy endings and like got them himself so that he would be able to like really you know understand what a happy ending is so um anyway i read that and i was like you know this is interesting but i was wondering what a book about sex would look like told from a female perspective and with women as the predominant characters and so that's where the genesis of the idea came from one of the things I really do love about your writing about sex and desire is that it's not about sexualizing it, if, for lack of a better word. It's mm -hmm. the way in which you talk about the women and normalizing them and humanizing them. I mean, not only in Three Women, but also, you know, in your other articles and pieces like from Rachel Ushutel to Jessica Simpson. And, you know, I just love the way that you are able to humanize someone and not glorify it or villainize it. Um, and, and I think it's just, is so relatable. And as women, I feel like we are so quick to jump on mm -hmm. that weird judgmental thing where yeah. we're cool, like we're all cool. And then suddenly we're not cool. Yeah. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Reading those characters, um, was like revisiting being a woman again and like where that desire comes from and then how that sort of sparks the rest of your life and decisions in a weird way. Yeah. 
I mean, I felt that too when I was talking to the women. I just felt it was bringing up so much, so many things that had happened to me. And you start to think about um, all of the little things, like these tiny little, you know, I've called it before and it sounds so, um, it, it sounds aggressive in a sense, but these tiny little rapes that I think women um, sustain and suffer throughout our lifetimes, that there's the actual rapes and then there's these little things that are maybe not as um as big obviously but they're these microaggressions that i think over time just add up and then we get to this place where we kind of have to think about who we are and um and we can and it also it, it's easy to sort of push that stuff down and then when i was talking to these women and other women i was like oh wait that's happened to me or that's happened to me and so that I found so um that's what I wanted to like kind of bring up to the surface I wanted to write something that would sort of um would show the way that I had experienced talking to them was there a particular character that like specifically gravitated towards you or do you feel like all of them were kind of equal in different ways or um, I felt I, they're all, I cared and continued to care about each of them. And I was endlessly just intrigued by all of their lives. But the one that was the most accessible emotionally and otherwise was Lena, um, the, uh, the housewife in rural Indiana, because when she first, um, when I first met her right away, she was talking about how her husband didn't want to kiss her on the mouth anymore. And it was so shocking that like the way that she said it was just, it, it was so trenchant and, um, and just beautiful in its own way because she understood so much how she deserved more. And with Lena, she wanted to just talk about everything and basically was using me as a kind of verbal diary. And it was basically exactly what I needed um, exactly what I wanted. And also she just, the idea with her, which is something that I think is a big theme, not just in, in that book, but in, in life is the idea of indifference and, um, Aiden, the, the high school lover that she reconnects with, who she's obsessed with, it doesn't text her back for days and she's just waiting there for a text. And the idea of him just not getting in touch until he's ready to, was so powerful to me that, that, that she was able to. So for me, Lena is kind of that, that, that fear of losing desire and that desire for desire kind of personified in, in a human being. So I would say Lena. Why are we holding our breath for these moments and not able to advocate or, you know, um, we're just wait, we're waiting on pins and needles for this thing and not able to advocate for ourselves and move forward. And I, I just felt like her story was so compelling and strong. Um, you know, and in advocating for ourselves, I felt like that was a theme throughout a little bit and the ability or inability for these women to advocate for themselves. I want to know like your take on that and what you thought about how they did or didn't and yeah, I mean, <clears throat> with uh, with Lena in particular, um, in that 30 minute thing was like so heartbreaking to me when she said that. And at the same time, like it was like, I, I totally understood that. And like you said, like I've been there in various ways. Um, and, but she was choosing that, like she was choosing to, to do that, to wait for this man. Yeah. She was also in a sense advocating for herself by, eschewing her, you know, Catholic upbringing and, um, and accepting what other people thought was good enough, which was two kids and a nice enough house and a husband who works. Um, and she was like, you know what, that's fine, but he's not kissing me in the mouth. I was raped as a young woman. I feel empty. And so I'm going to do this thing that fills me, even if it also is kind of, it, even if it explodes my my heart because at least I feel like something's happening inside. So I think, and I think as women, we have a big, we don't want to, to be weak to a, a man or any love interest, but, but I think that the weakness, it's not so much weakness to the, to the man. It's more like we are looking for something that we need. And so other women look at us and go, Oh, she's just like, why is she so like fucked up over that guy? And it's like, well, 
she might be fucked up over something else. And you just, it just looks like it's just this person, this man is like, happens to take the shape of what she needs. I think the biggest issue with women, I think women don't advocate for themselves because there's a fear of what happens if, if they either do advocate for themselves, like if you're doing too well in life and someone's not a friend, it's difficult. It's like a hard thing to, to, to just get through. And it's hard to, to be friends with either someone who's doing worse than you or someone who's doing better than you. And yeah. um, within love specifically is what I'm talking about. But yeah, so so I think I think it's such a thorny, um, interesting, sad, exciting territory to explore because I feel like there's hope at the end of the tunnel. And I mean, poor Maggie, her whole when she did advocate, I mean, her whole future essentially hinged on other people's perception of her, totally. um, which is so fucked up and mm-hmm. difficult and gut wrenching when she loses that that battle essentially but being so brave too for advocating for herself and being so young totally it's the the bravery she showed and continues to show is remarkable because she you know besides um besides being um besides being victimized as a as a young person she was also um she came from a part of town and a part of the world in a sense that that wasn't you know you're not supposed to advocate yourself if you're coming from a certain spot. And I think that that is so, it's so hard to, you know, like with, um, with everything that we're going through right now with Black Lives Matter, it's like, it's so hard to, we, those of us who are more fortunate can't even conceive of like, it's like, we think that, um, you know, I've been thinking about this so much specifically in regards to Maggie, when I first started the book, it's like, you don't, you look back and you go, oh, well, I did this, this, and this. And it's like, well, would I have been able to do this, this, and this had I been born into a different kind of place? And um, and I think that for people reading the book who have sort of excoriated like Lena or Maggie um, or Sloan for, Sloan for being too kind of having too much um, privilege, which is like interesting because it's like, you know, it's like no matter what we do, we're wrong. Um, and that's, and that's just so weird. It's like, if you come from poverty, then, you know, you shouldn't be out, you should stay where you are. Cause that's the feeling that people have. Um, Cause you can only be above someone if someone's below you. And, and so I think, and that's, and that's what I found time and again with, with desire. Um, I think it obviously is true of economics and, and just of social standing. But I think when it comes to desire, the same thing is true. You're not supposed to be happy. Um, there's times you're not supposed to be happy. And, and it's like, it, it, the clock on that is someone else's and not your own. Yeah, absolutely. It's so wild. Um, I had never even thought of the economics about desire, but it just reinforced like the Maggie story and the Sloan story like it was like Maggie deserved what she got in a sense mm-hmm. because you know she, her parents were fucked up and somehow you know that was the re- the excuse and and whatever but Sloane's parents were fucked up too and Sloane could be as promiscuous whatever you want you know sexual as you call it for very different reasons you know I think Sloane and I'm not her but it seems like that power that she got, that exchange of power and acting out, especially after the car crash and all that stuff and needing to have like some sort of release and escape and what have you. Um, But it's just so fascinating that, I mean, she certainly gets her own judgment from people, but it's almost more excused because of maybe the socioeconomic situation, which I never even thought of. Specifically, Lena didn't know that she could leave her husband and still like get child support. Most of the readers who have said something about Lena being, you know, um, about Lena being uh, just kind of self-hating or, or whatever, which I don't, I don't agree with, but, um, but it's because those people and many of us come from, you know, big cities and we, the news that we ingest is different. It comes from different sources. Lena had not 
the, you know, when it sort of first came out. And honestly, I mean, the last time I spoke to her, which was a couple of weeks ago, she was very not in the loop of like the Me Too movement. She did not know who Harvey Weinstein was. And, you know, it's like, we just don't, we can't accept that, um, not can't accept, but it's hard for us to remember that other people are not, it like, it can both yeah, all. exactly and um just commesting the same the same news we are and so yeah. that um yeah it's crazy so that the economics of desire it's an insane insane thing yeah and that it's not the wherever you are it doesn't it's not influenced by the media or whatever it just exists yeah we allow it to exist yeah uh, was it a coincidence that Maggie and Lena were raised with Catholic religious upbringings? This seems to be particularly relevant as to how this shaped and informed the women's lives and understanding of themselves sexually. Was, were you looking to contrast this upbringing with Sloane's apparent open sexual awareness and contrast the comparative freedom and openness with Sloane's sexual self does not seem to be any better, but is also informed by early trauma? Um, it wasn't, it, yeah, I guess suppose it was a coincidence. I wasn't really looking, I was looking for a sort of as wide of a swath as people as, of, as possible. And I started, the first draft had about 20 people in it. Um, the first draft I handed in, there were like a hundred people at one point, oh my but, God. um, but the people I chose were the ones who just gave me the most, like literally let me basically live with them. Um, and just told me all of their just desires and passions and pain. And, um, and so it wasn't, so whether, you know, Lena is Catholic and Maggie's, it, it, that had no bearing in the end, because in the end, it was just about choosing the three stories. And if you looked at, you know, if someone had looked at the first draft, it was like, those three women were like, hundreds of thousands of words each. And then the next one after that was like, 10. So it was just a matter of like, at what point are we just keeping other stories in for filler in a sense, because you, I didn't, my editor and I didn't feel like we were going to get, that it was going to sort of have the same importance um, and, and just kind of like relatability if all of a sudden there's these sort of other voices that are not as honest. Mm -hmm. When you were speaking to men, was there desire... I mean, I know you talk a bit about it in the prologue, and it's one of my favorite passages about their desire and basically giving the world up in like a second. It's like having these blinders on or something, you know, where all they can see is like eye on the prize. Mm -hmm. um, but would you say like when you were talking with them, is their desire, did it resonate at all similarly with women or is it, was it like, like drastically different? It was, it was different in the sense that the women were just, um, the, the men were like, I always think about this and I've said it before, but there's that, um, I think it's Annie Hall and it's Woody Allen is talking at this dinner party and there's this woman um, saying, you know, she doesn't know if she's had an orgasm. And then she says, well, maybe it just hasn't been a very good one. And Woody Allen says, really, that's weird because every orgasm I've had has been right on the money. And I think that's so funny because I think that's true for men. Or, but I think for women, it's like, you can't really separate that, 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 or at least the ones I spoke to, you can't really separate that physical feeling from the emotional as much because we're not biologically built that way. And so I just found those women's, the women's stories, the, the before and the after was as, was more important than the during in terms of the physical. And for men, it's at least the men that I spoke to, again, you know, I didn't speak to every man in the sort of world I spoke to you know a good amount but um but of the of the the sort of bar pie that I had it, it was just so much more the women's stories resonating with mm -hmm. me anyway yeah oh this is a good one and I've thought about this too how are the three women doing now are there any updates since you finished? Uh, I mean, Maggie, who's the only one who, whose name is um, is not uh, is not um, the only one who's not anonymous. Mm -hmm. um, she is doing phenomenally, which is probably the biggest person that everybody would want to sort of be doing great because she had the just you know what happened to her was horrific. 
Um, she is now um, in a position of a social worker doing amazing, helping young women like herself. She got like hundreds of emails, Instagram messages, as I did about for her, just saying like, you've helped me. Like, your story has made me feel heard. And um, one of the best things that happened for her was the, um, Abby Wambach, who was her hero growing up, posted a picture of herself reading Three Women. And oh my God. it was crazy. And I wrote to her and said, oh my God, you're Maggie's hero. And she publicly wrote back, um, Maggie's my hero. And so that for Maggie was like this, it was just amazing. And, and to get to be heard by, um, by uh, you know, one of the things I said to her when we started, I was like, look, I have no idea what I'm doing basically. And I have no idea how this is gonna go. But I do believe that if anyone out in the, I just think that if the population of people who hear about your story and not just this, your small, this like cross section of town, which is not, they weren't like ready, you know, to believe someone, to believe yeah. her. Um, and the fact that that came true is one of my biggest um, sort of satisfactions and successes from the book. And it's her bravery that did that, but I'm just really happy that I was able to kind of show other people it. Uh, was it a conscious decision to focus upon finding women's stories with some form of sexual trauma with difficulties understanding their own sense of self? All three women seem to have formed negative concepts of self-worth due to perching their own validity through men in their lives and external loci? Um, I did not, I was not looking for stories of sexual trauma. I did find that, like I was saying earlier, I did find that like, as women, we have a history of sexual trauma and, and we all experience, I mean, some of us might never have experienced it, but everyone that I spoke to did. Um, not just these three women, some of the women I spoke to experienced it exponentially more and some less, but ultimately it's like this sort of, it's like a, a just a buildup of plaque basically of, of things that have hurt us, um, of men that have hurt us, of other women who have hurt us. And that sort of the sexual threat of, um, of just the world when you're a woman um, is, it, it was such a pervasive theme and so I wasn't looking for it it just was there in terms of women and these three women determining their self-worth by by men I don't think that's what it was I think it was that they were looking for something inside of themselves and the man or the men or the women in their lives were the sort of conduits by which they were finding those things but I don't it wasn't about the man it was just it it was just, it was about what they were looking for inside of themselves. And some of them were looking for a lot more because of what was taken from them when they were younger. Did you ever consider writing the happy ending for the, late, the relationship between Maggie and her teacher? And if no, why? What was the purpose of writing such a direct finale? The happy ending, meaning like what? I mean, um... I mean, there was no happy, the happy ending has happened now. Um, I don't, there, you know, I mean, there was no happy ending to Maggie's story. So I wasn't, I wasn't interested in trying to like sew anything up with a bow. I really didn't want to make um, any judgments in, in terms of also happy endings. I mean, I think that the term happy endings is different to all of us. Like what, also there's no ending really and, and things keep evolving. So I think that writing a happy ending um, about real people doesn't really make sense. Yeah. No, I like that. I like, there is no happy ending. There's, there's no good and bad also. It's just like this journey that we're all on. I guess. What advice would you give to the younger version of Lena and Maggie? Well, I'd also say what advice would you give to Lena, Maggie, and Sloan? I wouldn't, you know, Lena used to ask me for advice a lot. And I would say to her, you know, one for one thing, I didn't want to affect the trajectory of her life or, or the book, or I didn't want myself as a kind of, you know, interviewer, journalist character to affect her life for a myriad of reasons. But, um, you know, ultimately, I don't like giving advice to people because I think that 
it's not real. First of all, I don't think we want advice, you know, specifically with desire. I mean, when I was younger, when my friends would be like, you know, what should I do? And it's like, oh, never talk to him again. But then like, they'd be like, okay, I'm never talking to him again. But then like, you know, the next day they'd be like, yeah. him. and it's like, it's fine. You know, like text him what you want. What I did with Lena um, is I would say, I don't, I don't know. She'd be like, should I text him? And I'd be like, I don't know. When I was in this situation, I did X, Y, Z. It made me feel like, you know, Z. Um, so, so I did a lot of that. Um, in terms of giving their younger selves advice, I, I don't know. I don't know what I would say to myself either, to be honest. I think part of it is like, you know, um, with my daughter, uh, who is someone that I'm trying to really give advice to, I, I, I would say like, don't look for the thing. Don't look for whatever you think you're missing inside of, inside of yourself in, in someone else. Can you talk a little bit more of the theme of mother-daughter parallels? That was it around this topic. Um, with all three women, do you think this could be a universal experience across varied cultural and religious upbringings? Um, I could definitely relate to that, and I come from a very traditional Indian background. Um, I think mother-daughter stuff is, I mean, that's one of the things, that's one of the reasons I wrote about my mom in the prologue. I think that mother-daughter um, relationships were so much, so much more of what affected the women's current desire than their relationships with their dads or their relationships with um with their friends there was the mother it was so important to them what they knew about their mother's desire what they didn't if they knew the perfect amount or too much or too little um it really affected things and i think that the mother-daughter relationship is you know across all cultures and all races and all um all gender all sexual predilections i think is so it's just so powerful and it's so scary and it's kind of like because our mothers are are you know they're women they're women and to sort of see what another woman and who is someone that you're supposed to look at for guidance who's had her own sets of it's just like oh my god you know like like you said like you know your mom made you like that but it's like you don't want to think about that and like why don't we want to think about it and there's these stigmas and but yeah i think the mother-daughter relationship is just the theme of it was running rampant through everyone that i spoke to what and what was the su most surprising thing that you learned in writing the book that everyone's sex lives were infinitely more interesting than i expected them to be really? i think yeah i think that the people with the most like you know there'd be people who i'd be like oh i can't even picture them having sex and then i would just hear these wild things and i was like i would never have guessed that that person would have had that life so basically i would say that people are having a lot more interesting sex than we all think that we're having i noticed an interesting idea while reading and that's uh women sometimes feel threatened by another woman's happiness and it's almost like women seek approval from other women over men. Can you discuss this idea? Because I find it so common in society. Yeah, I mean, I think that, I think one of the things that I really learned, I, I studied, studied I, I hung out at the Kinsey Institute in Indiana where they study sex, obviously. Um, and one of the things I, I'd always known, but I learned a lot more about is that, you know, women, as women, we are in competition for other women women in a sense for men biologically speaking to like there's more men than there are women in the sense of like one man can you know make 75 babies in a couple of you know days and and women <laughs> <laughs> and into their like 60s and 70s exactly. exactly and women you know sit at home for nine months like you know gestating and kind of like so so there's a there's a sexual biological competition that we are trying to sociologically fight against, which is great. But when we slip back into those things, it's like, you know, it's normal and it's okay. And I, so I think that, I think women judge other women because they want to be able to put them down so that they can feel better and that they can go after what they want. What are your next writing plans? I know that you um, talked about another novel. Is this, can you say anything about your next book or? Yeah, um, it's, it's, I'm always, I've had to like figure out how to do these things and I'm trying to, but with like a new book, I'm like, wait, what do I call, what, how do I talk about this one? But it's about, um, it's about female rage, a topic I'm very uh, interested in. And it's also about sisterhood and motherhood. It's, um, it starts out with a, 
with a man shooting himself in front of this woman who's the main character, which sets her off on this road trip from New York to California to, um, to find this woman who's the key to her past. And her past is like incredibly dark and shocking. And like this awful thing happened to her when she was 10. And so it leads her to this kind of like heinous act she ends up committing. And well, anyway, the point, the point is, um, the reason she ends up doing this bad thing is because bad things happen to her, uh, which is a theme of what I saw in Three Women. And um, one of the reasons I wanted to write it um, is because I think whenever women um, are angry and do like wild, crazy things, people call them sociopaths. And when men are angry, they're like these lions in, in the wild. And, um, and so I wanted to sort of explore the idea of women being called crazy for being angry and men not, or in fact, the total opposite. So that's where the sort of idea was born from. You really were the catalyst to start a book club. And it's not about selling anything other than we need to get together as human beings and read and read and talk yeah and read and talk and digest and get different ideas in whatever form that is there is no bad book just fucking read yes yeah. totally <laughs> fucking and read that's a good fucking thing. read fucking <laughs> read <laughs> <laughs> well thank you again i just have so much with this thank you this has been lovely and thank you to everyone for joining and for all your questions and yeah happy reading have fuck just fucking read. <laughs> Happy fucking reading. <laughs>